Welcome to the talk show, Lighting the Educational Flame, with your host, Mark Hoberman. The goal of this show is to provide a learning experience to people of all ages, with guests from various fields and academics, a wide range of industries, and insight into the many forms of art, athletics, and entertainment. We hope you enjoy the show. Comedian Damon Williams joins us today to talk about his career in comedy as well as his thoughts about recent events in Hollywood. Damon's career is still going strong after decades in comedy. Hello and welcome to Lighting the Educational Flame with Mark Hoberman. Joining me today is comedian Damon Williams. Damon will bring us up to speed on the latest in Hollywood and beyond. Let's bring him on. Damon Williams, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. How are you, Mark? Doing well, thank you. So nice to have you here. Damon, I got to first open up and ask you, as a seasoned comedy veteran, uh, your opinion of the latest events in Hollywood, it's important to me. The other day, the Grammys were called by some as the slapless Grammy Awards. So what is your take on what happened a week uh, earlier at the Academy Awards? I mean, I, I, I know you worked, you worked with Chris Rock. Yeah, I've worked with Chris. Um, and, you know, he's a good guy. I've known him to be, you know, cordial and personable. Uh, comedy is subjective, but I don't think anybody deserves a slap in the face for a quick quip such as that. Um, especially if you've seen other award shows like the Golden Globes and the SAG Awards, they go really hard. And, and then there's comedy roasts as well. And you've seen many of those. So now we've become so sensitive. Now, mind you, who knows what Will and Jada were going through when when Will came to her honor and defended her because of her condition, and that's what the you know speculation is. But at no point in time should a person be slapped for their humor. Right, and it's interesting. I never thought it along the lines of the roast because I've thought of award shows where I've heard worse digs with people in the room. Uh, but when you talk about the comedy roasts, I mean, some of them, I'm like, boy, if I was in that seat, I would either leave or. It's unbelievable. So, uh, but, but you, I mean, I've, I've seen so many different comedians. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about Don Rickles to Louis C.K. and the whole thing. And that's the, I've, I don't believe I've ever perceived a comedian to on purpose hurt someone. I mean, a comedian once asked me a question in the front row and I'll never be in the front row again. Thank you very much. And I made <laughs> my, what was probably a funny retort. And then the person buried me for 10 minutes. Deservedly so, but uh, that really just came out of left field. So uh, how do you handle that? How do you handle hecklers? I mean, your career has spent, I can't read everything because it would take an hour, but you've been on BET, Showtime for the Apollo, the kings of comedy. You've written right. the biggies. I mean, just tremendous people in the business. But when you're up there, how do you deal with hecklers? Not the ones that come up and even smack you, but the ones who say things and kind of throw you off. Well, you know, first of all, hecklers, I, I don't get a, a lot of hecklers, but it's, it's a way, whenever you're addressing someone in the audience, you have to keep in mind that everybody's there to have a good time, you know, or you assume that. And so if I have a heckler and the heckler interrupts me, I'll say something or address the heckler in a way that even the heckler can laugh at themselves. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't take it personal. I, you know, I've developed a thick skin on stage and it's not mean spirited. So you know, it's easy to have a quick, you know, snapback uh, response. But if you see a comic becoming belligerent, now you've given the power to the heckler. Right. And it is about, it's about, it's about power. It's amazing how you could have the mic on the stage and the microphone is, is the power. But, you know, it's also how much they throw you off, which is why I was very impressed with Chris Rock. His reaction was so professional that that's why the first three minutes I thought it was a joke. Because, Indeed. Uh, I still um, marvel at his composure from that situation, even though he was you could see he was flustered when he tried to continue. Um, and I had made a joke. I said he couldn't even read the teleprompter. It was like uh, Will smacked the literacy out of him. <laughs> but <laughs> I've never seen anybody get slapped dumb right quick. But he was shocked. And, and, and based on what I've heard since then, and Chris has a condition, uh, nonverbal learning disorder or something of, of that in nature, and it, it says he doesn't pick up on, um, you know, body language. So because a typical brother, you know, standing there and somebody's approaching, you just made a joke about their wife. The least you would do is duck. You know, if, <laughs> if he had his hands behind his back, he said, uh oh, and he just stood there and took the smack, right. which made it look more staged. But like I said, his reaction afterwards clearly defined to me that he wasn't 
uh, in on this particular thing that took place. So, you know, nowadays we have to be careful. There's so much sensitivity in, in, in the audience and in the culture. Um, so I feel like this, even if you're talking about a subject that could get you a hashtag movement against you, make sure the people in that hashtag can laugh at the joke. So I won't pick a particular category, but okay, I do a joke about Biden being old. So if you're going to do a senior citizen joke, senior citizens should be able to laugh at the joke. Absolutely. Yeah, good, good point. And I have to tell you that in, in rewinding and watching it over and over again, he was laughing and leaned in. He said, oh, here comes King Richard. So I right. don't know if you expect him to say, yo, that's funny or just take it down a notch. I don't think anyone on earth in an award show, I mean, he didn't walk up to him in a bar. He walked up to him on the stage at, uh, at the Academy Awards. And I, I think that people like uh, Sidney Poitier were rolling over in his grave because uh, he set the award show back quite a bit. But uh, I also think about it, and so many comedians and performers are weighing in saying, hey, we've hurt people's feelings before. I mean, you're very quick-witted. I, I, I taught for many years and I was kind of quick-witted in the classroom, but I never intentionally hurt someone's feelings. And I definitely did on several occasions. I mean, if you roll back the videotape, you know, right. I would have done the same thing. But is this going to change anything you do on stage? Are you going to stage? I mean, I've seen your act, much of your act, acts, and, and you're quick. So are comedians now going to have to slow down a little bit and run through their mind? What's this going to end up with? Where's the mindset? Uh, if we start doing that, then the, the craft is, is damaged. And, you know, to be honest, it should be a natural reaction. You do have to be more methodical for safety's sake because you know now people might want to imitate that that moment or feel like they it's like it's like you he, he dropped the, the third wall and allowed you know uh, comedy be, to become uh, almost a victim of you know people's retaliation and, and that's that's unfortunate but I, I'm certainly not going to I don't think about it I mean, I'm in the zone first of all if you're making people laugh it's it's, it's you know it's a, less likely that they want to slap you. So I just keep the laughs coming as much as possible. But in this situation, I've had a, a person approach me and rush me on stage. I've actually had an altercation on stage unprovoked very early in my career. And, uh, you know, we just tussled. We we made a hole in the drywall and security snatched them out of there. So what's who the people that would benefit from this are security firms because most right. people will – now higher security, comedy clubs will have more security, more adequate security, and it's necessary. It shouldn't have been, but now that's the life, the world we live in going forward. And um, I highly recommend that that be a part of your expense when you're putting together a comedy show is to have a, a security person or personnel, professional security there yeah. for the comedians. Brilliant, brilliant. That's, a, that's an excellent point. Uh, you mentioned something about being in the zone. So I like to tell jokes and be funny and all that, but I have to tell you, uh, you know, I have tremendous respect for salespeople because I hate sales and a no is really bad for me. If I tell a joke and nobody laughs, my next joke is two months later. Yeah. How do you, you know, because I always like to talk about the, uh, the story behind the glory. You're a tremendously successful comedian, but you're doing a show. And if I'm doing a show, everybody has to laugh at every joke. And how does that roll? How do, how do you roll with that punch? for lack of a better term, you say a joke, you think it's funny, they laughed at it three nights ago, hysterical. Right. You do it in right. another location, boom, and you hear crickets. What is that like? Uh, you know, that it's a rare occurrence because, I, I mean, I've you know, been doing it a long time, like you say, but when it does happen, um, it, it throws you a bit, but you got to have another joke ready. Or you acknowledge the fact that, you know, people love to see you know, self-deprivating uh, uh, humor, where you, you defer to yourself and say, well, that didn't work. You know, it was funnier yesterday or it worked in the car. You know, there's, there's all yeah, right. responses to that. I have a, a bigger problem when I'm on stage, and this just happened this weekend in Memphis, when people are chatting at their tables, you know, and like when the check comes out and they just totally zone out and they, they're looking at the bill and they got the, the light on their phone is lit up and they're going over, they got the calculators out. I'll address that sometimes because I'm like, you know, the bill, you can pay it at any point. You know, you shouldn't let this distract you from your time. Or sometimes, you know, because we are very sensitive. So there was one time and there were some people, a couple, and they were right in the front this, this weekend as well. And I told the joke and everybody's laughing and they laugh. And then I'm going to the next joke. Now they're sitting there kind of conversing. Right. But what they were doing was they were re, uh, reliving a, an experience that kind of mirrored the joke. So they okay. were 
talking about the joke, but I'm like, hey, I'm on to the next one, you know? So you look at it like, are y'all like sitting right in the front, ignoring me and having a conversation in the middle? You know, how dare you, you know? Uh, when, but then they say, we were talking about the joke, you know? So you have to, you have to time yourself, you have to have patience and actually, uh, like I said, have a thick skin and don't take it personal because comedians are some of the most sensitive people on earth, like, you know, a lot of comedians don't like to be joked on, you know, oh, yeah. you'll see how uncomfortable comedians are when they're sitting there at a roast and they're being roast and they're like, <laughs> you can see the phony laugh, yeah, yeah. Laugh the you know, because nobody wants to be in that position. So I keep that mindset and I don't really focus in on a person and make them the brunt of the joke unless it's a, a, a you know, a pleasant joke where they can laugh as well. That's great. And, and you know, what's interesting also is, uh, your humor and the humor of a lot of comedians, actually my, my favorite comedians, I've never heard them tell a joke. They just speak the truth. That's what I love about your humor. It looks like, you know, Mark, listen to what happened on the way to the show tonight. And you just know how to take it to the next level. But I know some comedians have writers. Am I correct that you are your writer? Oh, yeah. Every joke I've ever told came from my brain because most of it is something I live through. You know, like you say, I used to sit down and methodically write out a bit and have a, you know, a set up the middle of the punchline, you know, because that's what you're taught to do. But now, I, I, you know, it's an innate uh, ability to just convey my thoughts or my, my take on a, on a to topic, uh, you know, with a humorous outcome. Yeah, that's that, that's amazing, because if you've written you've written jokes for other people, other other performers who weren't even. Uh, comedians, you know, other celebrities who I guess uh, use some material that you provided them with uh, in, in their acts, correct? Uh, yeah, but just recently I, w I, w I went on a couple of tour dates with Sherry Shepard. Uh, she's now going to be the new host. She's taking over the show that was formerly the Wendy Williams show. Right. It'll be the Sherry show next season. And she took me out with her because she's on a, a, a concert tour with uh, Babyface and an artist named Kim. And, you know, she had never done this type of crowd, you know, shows with this magnitude because these are, you know, small arenas. And so I went, we did a weekend at Caroline so I could get the, the, the spirit of her material and the, her rhythm. And then we went out and did the first two concert dates. And I hit her with a couple of punchlines along the way to punch up what we had worked on already. And now she took it and she ran with it. And, you know, so I was very proud of that. I hadn't done much of that because a lot of times, you know, when I write a joke, it's my baby. You know, I want to keep it for myself. So uh, it's, it's, it's very rare that I give it away or even, you know, sell it. That's incredible because a lot of people just don't, you know, the average person who's not a comedian doesn't realize the work behind it. Uh, I'm an educator for over 30 years. And the fact that you went out, you didn't just say, here's the joke. The fact that you researched a rhythm because it wasn't just the joke. It was the person delivering the joke. So mm -hmm. I think that's golden right there. That really speaks to who you are and the level of professionalism necessary to be successful in your cra craft. But it just, you know, you didn't just come out of the womb and say, boom, give me the lights. Let's start talking. So we all know about the class clown. And some people say, oh, that guy was the class clown. I knew he'd be a comedian. This and that. But, but when did Damon Williams first say, hey, I'm going to do this full time? You know, to be honest, once I did it the first time, I was hooked. Uh, literally said, okay, when I got that first, because I had, you know, he gave me three to five minutes or whatever. Adele Givens was the host at All Jokes Time. When I did that first five and, I, you know, maybe four of the five bits I was able to do, they hit. And by the third one, I was like, wow, y'all really laugh, you know? Uh, so it caught me by surprise and I recorded it and I watched it. But at that point, I was like, okay, this is something I want to do because I had the opportunity in the time. I was a, a Subway sandwich franchise owner and I had just sold my store because it wasn't doing well and I didn't have an occupation. So I had time to delve directly into it and, you know, sort of live off the proceeds of the sales. So I was fortunate in that way. Uh, but I never looked back, you know, once I got in, you know, because I always enjoyed the, the art form. Like you mentioned some of my favorite comedians earlier when you said Don Rickles and Rodney Dangerfield. I mean, I watched Bob Hope as a kid. Any Anytime a comic came on The Tonight Show, you know, I would light up, you know, and so going forward, you have, you know, Richard Pryor, of course, in the household. So I've always enjoyed the craft. I always enjoyed the art form. And then once I was, I figured out I could do it in the 80s, uh, you know, Eddie Murphy came on the scene with Delirious and the Red Leather Suit. And, you know, everybody was kind of mimicking Eddie because we watched that tape until it popped. Yeah. Um, you know, and so around my office, I worked in an office job in Chicago City Hall. They began to call me Eddie. You know, like as a nickname because I was silly around the office or whatever. And then I said, okay. And I wasn't even trying to be super funny, but 
obviously some of my thought processes led to people laughing. So my one of my sisters was like, you are funny. You really need to look into that. And, um, you know, I just started doing it from there. I think it's incredible because people have said to me at times, oh, Mark is so funny. You should go into comedy. And I said, I could go into comedy if everyone in the audience is someone I know for 10 years. I could <laughs> never go and talk to who am I making fun of? I don't know who they are. I can't see right. them because the lights are in my face. I just don't understand it. And you know what? I'm sure in a, in a career such as yours that has spanned decades, you're not always in the best of moods every time. But when you go on that stage, nobody cares. Hey, I paid. You better make me laugh. So there's Indeed. a lot going on. So, you know, I know that you did uh, own the Subway uh, sandwich franchise. I have to tell you, the many times I've been in Subway, you must have picked up a lot of material from that game. <laughs> hey, man, the funniest thing about that is when I first started doing stand up after I sold my store, this lady uh, approached me. And of course, yes, there was plenty of material with the customers and the interaction and, and me and the staff because I had to, uh, two brothers and, and two cousins working. So, you know, we were we were a unit. Uh, like and we would all go hoop afterwards. We were like a basketball team that that ran a subway that played hip hop music it, while the customers came in. Um, but right after I opened my, you know, after I closed, I should say, and I was doing stand up maybe three or four months, and this lady approached me. She's like, "Hey, I know you," and I'm like, "Yeah, you know, comedian." She's like, "No, you put extra mail on. You gave me the subway." You know, like, she, she recognized me from the subway and not from my humorous career. But yeah, anytime you interact with the public. If you just sit in an airport or in a, a bus terminal or anywhere where people are interacting, you can become a comedian if you are able to document what takes place. Oh, for sure. For sure. sure. And it's great because uh, the fact that you rec recognize you from, from one situation, not another. But hey, you know, that means you did your job really well then, too. So it, it sounds to me like uh, you have a mindset of no matter what you do, you know, you're like a, a, a comedic entrepreneur. You've done so many things. And you've really been blessed with some of these these uh, uh, gigs that you've had. Uh, yes, it's been tremendous. Yeah. Yep. Oh, I have a question for you. Like, uh, it's like a busman's holiday. What is it like when you? What do you look for in a comedian besides just make me laugh? Because you go in, and I'm and if I'm giving a comedy show, I'm already feeling uneasy because Damon's in the house, and you know I'm going to do my routine. What do you look for? Um, for people to make me laugh from a perspective I, that I ain't see coming. If you can catch me by surprise, or if you if you can, divert, you know, divert and uh, drop a, a drop. I like to call them a drop off. So, for instance, for Sherry, I wrote a joke. Uh, now, Will Smith, the situation had just happened, uh, and she went out on her first show that Wednesday following. So, I told her you need to go up and do a bit about you know the elephant in the room. Everybody's talking about it. Blah 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 blah. And so you set it up by saying, yeah, you know, and I know as a comedian, you know, everybody's everywhere I go, I hear this stuff and everybody's talking about it. And then she goes to say, how could Pfizer ask us to take a fourth booster? You know, now, so you nobody's looking for that to come Correct. from that. So when you have jokes like that, I, I love when people catch me like that or just, you know, something that I wouldn't have thought of, no matter how clever it is. Just the fact that I didn't think of that, well, I didn't see it from that angle. I didn't see that coming. That always entertains me for sure. So who are some of your favorite comedians out there? Man, you know, we get in trouble when we do these lists. Um, uh -oh. but, but but there are so many, you know. Right now, who's killing it, man? Dion Cole out of Chicago. He's on the tear. His last special was incredible. Um, I, I like Tony Roberts because he, he's hysterical. He has an energy that's out of control. Bill Burr is is amazing to me. Uh, the, the late, great uh, Patrice O'Neill was one of the best ever, you know, and then there's a, a multitude of my peers that I work with, um, uh, you know, I'm, and I'm friends with Anthony Brown and, and George Wallace, the two of them, when they get together, and then there's some unknown names, people like my a friend of mine named Marlon Mitchell out of Chicago, hysterical guy, always, though, like, when you sit down, when you run around, when you he's on stage, hilarious dude. Um, Gary Owen has done some good work, Lavelle Crawford, uh, Wanda Sykes. I liked Ellen before she stopped uh, doing stand up, you yes. know, before she got the show. She was very clever. She has a bit about trying on new shoes. And, it's, you know, she just takes the subtle little nuances of life and just blows them up to be hilarious. Uh, so the list is, is, is immense. Um, and I really became a fan of Sherry Shepard after working with her because I had never seen her really do stand up. But she was fearless. The fact that you can give somebody a bit. I say it's, it's 7,000, 6,000, 5,000 people, however many people are. And I gave her the bit 
and we, she went up and did her first sip. We went in the, in the dressing room. I gave her a bit for her second set. She went right out and tried it. She didn't say, well, let me wait till I go to someplace small. And that fearlessness impressed me. And, and she delivered and she nailed it. So I've become a fan of hers. Um, Flame on Road, we just did um, Caroline's. And Flame gave me an opportunity just to come and do the guest spot while I was watching Sherry because they were on the show together. And Flame impressed me. Flame, for her niche, Flame is a transgender comic. But Flame, um, her audience loves her. And she plays to her strengths. And I, I was one of the first people to ever introduce her to stand up. So it's it's a whole list of people that I'm forgetting right now. Um, trust right. me when I tell you. I know it's tough. I'm I'm sure. Well, yeah, when you're in yeah. as long as you, you could probably talk about them for, for hours on end. So, Indeed. Uh, yeah, so there's, uh, you're, you're, you're 25 or more years in and you're just getting started. So, what's, what's next for Damon Williams? Well, I'm, I'm uh, auditioning for roles now. I've done a couple of independent films. Uh, I did one that actually made it to theaters, which is called White People Money. Um, and now I play you know, a, a quirky little character in that one. Uh, there's a couple of other ones already done. But I, I've got some opportunities lined up, and I'm steadily pursuing those. I have a series uh, that is little known that people have not discovered yet, but it's on a, a new streaming platform called Urban Flix TV. And it's a stand-up series. I do an interview. I do a one-on-one interview before the comic goes out and does their set. So we get the backstory, then they perform. And that's uh, Urban Flix TV. It's called Laugh Tonight with Damon Williams. Um, besides that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm touring and I'm, I'm definitely going to record a, an hour. I just, I actually recorded an album in Atlanta, but I'm not sure if I'm going to use it because I'm not happy how that one, the crowd went. But um, look for another album coming out called Still At It. Uh, depending on which ones we edit. So it's a lot of things working toward, you know, this 2022 being a big year. Excellent. All right. We could use it for sure. So yeah. uh, Damon Williams, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your expertise and your passion for comedy. And to the viewers, thanks uh, for watching. And we'll see you next time. Damon, thank you so much. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for watching Lighting the Educational Flame. To contact Mark Hoberman, email him at info at gradesuccess.com or visit him on social media through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Thank you for watching Lighting the Educational Flame.